So magnetism, well we're going to start by first of all stating which metals are magnetic. That is iron, steel, cobalt and nickel and the two most common examples you'll come across are obviously iron and steel. Do notice that steel is an alloy of iron which means that it contains iron but it also contains the element carbon. A few basics to point out which is if you have a bar magnet or any magnet remember that two north poles will repel so if you try and push them together they'll slide past each other. The same is true with south poles, they'll repel as well, and the opposites attract, so a north pole will attract a south pole. Looking at the difference between a soft magnetic material and a hard magnetic material now, the real difference is that a hard magnetic material maintains its magnetism, so steel, for example, is a hard magnetic material, it does not lose its magnetism easily, whereas iron loses it very easily. And to put this into context, if we use a scrap metal yard as our example here, scrap metal yards are full of big old lumps of iron which need moving around. Now you actually use a magnet to move them around and what you do is you turn on a massive iron electromagnet and it becomes magnetised, it clamps down and picks up that metal that it's trying to move and then when you've moved it across to the new position you can basically cut the power source and it will lose its magnetism. You couldn't use steel in this case because you'd effectively find that all that scrap metal would remain stuck to the magnet and you'd never be able to pull it off. So what is a magnetic field line? Well it's the space around a magnet whereby magnetism can be detected and in terms of designing experiments whereby you can determine the shape of magnetic field lines you have two options here. First of all iron filings and secondly using plotting compasses. So what you do is you get a piece of paper you sprinkle iron filings onto it and then you place a bar magnet underneath and you'll see that those iron filings align themselves with the magnetic field. With a plotting compass instead you place your bar magnet on a piece of paper, you place a plotting compass near to it and you make a note of the direction which the arrow on the plotting compass is pointing and then you pick it up, put it in a new position, keep repeating that process until you've drawn the magnetic field lines. Now just remember that a solenoid is a cylindrical coil of wire. Touching now on the right hand grip rule, so this is just a way of showing the direction of magnetic field lines. So my thumb represents a wire, so in this case it's going from north to south, or from up to down. And you might be asked to draw the magnetic field line directions, and just follow the direction which your fingers are pointing. Be aware of a uniform magnetic field, and all you'll see here is that the lines the magnetic field lines are evenly spaced and that they're parallel and those are the two points you need to point out with a uniform magnetic field. So how can an object's magnetism be induced? So how can it become magnetic? Well first of all you need to start with a magnetic metal such as iron and steel and then you can place it inside the magnetic field of a permanent magnet and its magnetism will be created or induced. Obviously the moment you remove that object, the iron object, from that magnetic field, it will lose its magnetism. Steel, I've already pointed out, is a hard magnetic material, so it will tend to retain its magnetism. So how is a simple electromagnet constructed? And that's simply by connecting a wire to a circuit and running a current through it. How can we increase the strength of the magnetic field of that wire carrying a current? Well, the most basic thing we can do is obviously increase the current and we can also wrap the wire into a solenoid so if we coil it up that will also increase its magnetic field strength. We're now interested in increasing the magnetic field of a solenoid. Because it's already in a coil what you can do now is add more turns of coil or you could add an iron ore which is just like an iron bar which you thread through the middle of the solenoid. You can also increase the current as I've already specified. We're now looking at the motor effect, which is the part of this topic which people really aren't a fan of. But if I talk you through the overview first of all, and then we'll look a bit more closely about how it all works. So let's start by looking at what the motor effect really is. And all the motor effect is, know that a motor is a piece of wire that spins. So that's what's happening in a motor, a wire is spinning. And we're trying to work out how we can create that, and that is via the motor effect. And you might have seen a simple motor being built at school. So what you have here is you have two permanent magnets, you have a wire in between them which is coiled up and then that is attached to an electrical circuit so it can carry a current 
And the point here is that when the wire carrying the current is placed within this magnetic field of the two permanent bar magnets, you find that there's a phenomenon which we call the motor effect. And what will happen is that wire will start spinning and you have a simple motor. But that's only if you've got a coil of wire placed within the magnetic field of two permanent magnets and it needs to carry a current. And you've probably heard of Fleming's left hand rule and that's what I'm going to talk about now. And that's just a way of working out whether the coil moves up on one side or whether it moves down. Because obviously it has to move up to begin its spin, then it moves down, moves up, it moves down. So that's what's happening with our motor. So looking at Fleming's left hand rule, you've got to hold your thumb, forefinger and second finger at right angles to each other. Now the thumb represents the force or the motion and that will show the direction in which one side of that coil will be moving. So taking the left hand side for example, in this instance it would be moving upwards. The first finger, magnetic feet. The first finger shows the direction of the magnetic field and remember that the magnetic field always runs from north to south. So based on that diagram you get given in the exam or in your textbook, have a look at those two permanent bar magnets, look at the north pole, look at the south pole and make sure that your first finger matches up with that. Your second finger shows the direction of the current and on your textbook it should show an arrow showing which way the current's running, if it's running clockwise or anti-clockwise just make sure that that finger is lined up there. So once you've lined up your magnetic field, which is your first finger, your current, which is your second finger, you'll find that your thumb either points up or it points down. And so it will ask you which direction will the coil move and you will say upwards or you will say downwards. But just make sure you've got them all in 90 degree planes to each other. My way of remembering what finger stands for what is that the first finger is your magnetic field, first field, Second, it contains a C, means that it is showing you the direction of the current. So in terms of answering the five markers, which tend to be something like a wire is placed within the magnetic field and a force is felt, discuss. It's worth five marks. So it doesn't matter how they word up these questions, the answer is always the same. You want to start by saying the wire carrying the current, so your coil, has a temporary magnetic field and what that does is it interferes and it interacts with the permanent magnetic field of the bar magnets. This creates a force causing the wire to turn. And believe it or not, this applies as well when you're talking about a loudspeaker because anything that moves in and out in this way involving magnets will use the motor effect even though it doesn't seem particularly obvious. So taking the speaker cone for example, we start by saying that the wire carrying the current has a temporary magnetic field. This interacts with the permanent magnetic field of the bar magnets found in the speaker. This creates a force, and this force moves the speaker cone upwards, vibrating air particles, causing the sound that reaches your ears. So you're using the same answer here. And honestly, as long as there's a wire moving or the speaker cone moving, your answer remains the same. The photograph shows a small electric motor. Explain why the coil starts to spin when the switch is closed. Remember, this is a magnetism question. So this is an answer which you can definitely rote learn. So what you want to say is when the switch is closed that the current flows around the circuit. This creates a temporary magnetic field around the magnet, which you can see is near the coil. It's, it's stuck in the coil, so right here is where the magnet is. So this temporary magnetic field interacts with the permanent magnetic field of the magnet, which creates a force, and that force is what is used to turn the coil. And you can mention Fleming's left hand rule just for an extra mark. Suggest how to make the coil spin in the opposite direction. The obvious thing here is to switch the direction of the current, or you could have swapped the magnets over. Suggest how to make the coil spin more slowly. So how do we weaken that magnetic field? Well, we can reduce the current. You could also reduce the voltage or had a weaker magnetic field, which is harder to quantify. 3A, state what is meant by the term magnetic field line, and that's a line that shows the direction of the magnetic field. The diagram shows a cross section through a wire placed between two magnetic poles, and the wire carries electric current into the page at X. The shape of the magnetic field is shown. Add arrows to any two lines to show the direction of the magnetic field. Now remember that it runs from north to south, and we have to do that on at least two lines, so I've done two there. Draw an arrow on the diagram to show the direction of the force on the wire and label this F. So this is where Fleming's left hand rule comes in. 
So remember that your thumb shows the direction of the force. Your index finger shows the direction of the magnetic field and your second finger shows the current. So make sure you've, you're holding your left hand up here. Make sure that your second finger is pointing downwards at X. Then line it up so that your first finger is pointing north to south. And then when you've done this, you'll see that your thumb is pointing to the right. And remember, that shows the force, which is why it's in this direction. Now we need to describe the magnetic field in the region shown inside the dotted square. So if you have a look at that, you can see that, first of all, the magnetic field isn't uniform because they're the lines are differing spaces apart. And also notice that they're flowing in the same direction, so they are parallel to each other. Now we're gonna look at electromagnetic induction or basically how voltage or current may be induced. It's a very similar concept, we just need to look at it from a slightly different angle. So I hope you realise that with your force and your magnetic field and your current, it's a bit like a physics formula triangle, which is that if you put in magnetic field and you put in current, then you get force. So it makes sense, therefore, that if you put in the force, you put in the magnetic field, then you should be able to make current. And indeed, that's what electromagnetic induction is all about. If a wire is moved into a magnetic field at right angles, then you find that a voltage will be induced. And if it's connected up to a complete circuit, that's where your current comes from. Do notice that you must move the wire or the magnets, it doesn't matter which way around you do it, but you must move them at 90 degrees to each other. If they're parallel, then you won't induce your voltage. Now, in terms of working out which direction everything's going to move in, this time you use Fleming's right hand rule. So you find, again, that the thumb shows the direction of the force or the motion. First finger is the magnetic field, second finger is the current, but you have to use your right hand because otherwise it won't line up properly if you use your left hand. And this is really how a simple generator works because if you're creating current, then clearly you could make electricity from that and all a generator is is a machine which creates electricity. So how could you increase the size of that induced current? Well, clearly you could use stronger magnets, you could use a, have a stronger magnetic field, you could move the wire more quickly, and you could wrap the wire into a coil. Looking at the use of generators in everyday life, you can use the example of a bicycle dynamo. And just to explain what this is, so some bikes, I don't know if you've ever used the Boris bikes in London, or any of those bikes you can rent in other countries. I don't know if you've ever cycled them in the night time, but they have lights, and it's not because they have batteries that need replacing. It's because they contain simple dynamos, which uses your motion of pedaling the bike to actually power the lights. So we need to explain from an electromagnet point of view how that works. So as you turn your pedals, clearly the bicycle wheel turns. This turns a magnet, which is located within a coil, and this magnetic field of the magnet cuts the surrounding coil which induces a current. So within a bicycle dynamo you find that there is indeed a simple generator. Also be aware of the roles of the relay switch and the circuit breaker and an electric doorbell. Do notice that with these sorts of questions it's most likely they'll give you a diagram and it's just up to you to describe what is happening. So always start with the switch when you're talking about the doorbell. So you press the switch causing a current to flow the current flows to the electromagnet, causing it to become magnetised, and the designs of these bells will vary a fair amount, but they're fundamentally the same. There'll be an iron rod or an iron armature, which will be attracted, and because of the way it's pivoted, it means that it's attached to a bell that hits a gong, and that's how the doorbell sounds. So just make sure you look at the diagram you're given and follow those steps around, starting from the switch being pressed, it and you will get your marks. Do notice that a relay switch is effectively a safety device. It's used to turn on very large currents. So what you find is you press the switch to complete the circuit and it will be attached to a different circuit which contains a much larger voltage and it's a safety device because you don't want the person touching the switch attached to the very high voltage supply such as one million volts because if there's a fault it could easily kill them, it could electrocute them and this is seen in things like floodlights at stadiums there can be millions of volts going through those huge lights you don't want the person in danger so that's where a relay switch may be used and you can also find it in car engines you turn your key, that will be involved in a relay switch which will be involved in turning on the car engine 
with the circuit breaker this is a safety device used in houses so it's when the current becomes dangerously high you find that the electromagnet becomes magnetized pulling away part of the circuit meaning that the circuit is no longer complete and therefore you've cut off the supply in electricity you'll have met fuses they work in a similar way they're both safety devices however you will find that a circuit breaker is preferred because it responds far more quickly and it's much easier to reset because you simply press a button now it's time to look at the maths element of this topic so we need to look closely at transformers and using the various equations involved in that Diagram 1 shows some of the apparatus used to investigate the force on a current carrying wire XY in a magnetic field. Diagram 2 shows the poles of the magnet viewed above. Draw the uniform magnetic field between the poles. Okay, this isn't as hard as it might sound. You just need to draw straight lines, so use a ruler. I'm not using a ruler because I'm using the iPad. And you need to do a minimum of three, and then obviously the magnetic field goes from north to south, so add arrows showing that, and that is more than enough. The current carrying wire X, Y is at right angles to the magnetic field. The current in the wire is 10 amps. Suggest why the wire used in this investigation must be thick. Any sensible suggestion, so otherwise a large heat might cause it to melt if it was too thin, or you could say a thicker wire is used to reduce the resistance, or you could say that it doesn't so that it doesn't sag or bend. Explain why the wire X, Y experiences a force when there is a current in the circuit. So have another look here. This is quite hard, but just say that the magnetic field of the wire interacts with the magnetic field of the two magnets and you actually get a mark for just mentioning Le Fleming's left hand rule. These questions are strange with electromagnets, just kind of write down everything you know even if you're worried about whether it actually fits the context of the question. State two ways in which this force may be reduced. Okay, you could reduce the current or you could use less powerful magnets. The photographs show how an electric toothbrush fits on its charger. The charger and the toothbrush each have a coil of wire inside them. The diagram shows how the two coils are linked by a U-shaped core. This arrangement of core and coil acts as a transformer that reduces voltage. Name the type of transformer that reduces voltage. Well, that would be a step-down transformer. Explain why the core is made of a soft magnetic material such as iron. Remember, it's because iron is softly magnetising and therefore it loses its mag magnetism easily and also you need to state the fact that the magnetic field in the core can change. State the equation linking the input primary and output secondary voltages and the turns ratio of a transformer. This is something you're just going to have to learn. So write input voltage divided by output voltage equals primary turns divided by secondary turns. Please just learn that off by heart. The transformer has 520 primary turns and 30 secondary turns. The input voltage to the transformer is 44 volts. Calculate the output voltage. So let's just substitute those numbers in. So that calculation will look like this. The input voltage is 44. We're looking at the output, so I'm going to put X here. Primary turns is 520. Secondary is 30. It's up to you what maths you want to use to do this. What I tend to do is flip the whole lot so it becomes X over 44 equals 30 over 520. And then all you need to do is use your calculator to do 30 divided by 520 and then times it by 44 to get x by itself and x will equal 2.5 volts. The diagram shows parts of a transformer. The input voltage to the transformer is 230 volts, the output is 25, there are 100 turns on the secondary coil, name the type of transformer shown in the diagram. Well, it's a step down because the output voltage is lower, so right step down there. State the equation linking input, primary voltage, output, secondary voltage, primary turns, and secondary turns. We really need to learn all these equations. So this is what the equation is. Remember that it's input, primary voltage, over output, which is secondary voltage, equals number of primary turns divided by secondary turns. So now we're calculating the number of turns on the primary coil, so I'm going to be using that equation and x is therefore np here and then let's substitute what we know we know that there are 100 turns on the secondary coil oh my gosh the gardeners are so noisy and then on the output of the transformer we've got 25 volts so that's voltage on the secondary and then if you scroll up you'll see that the input voltage in the primary side is 230 and now you need to solve that for x 
So just do 230 divided by 25, times it by 100, and you'll have 920 turns. B. Explain how transformer works. In your answer, you should include the reasons for using two coils, the iron core and alternating supply. Don't stress too much if you're like, oh, I don't know how to crowbar those things into my answer. Just write what you would write normally and you'll find that they'll just fit in. So first of all, say that transformer either steps up or steps down the voltage. Say that the current in the primary coil produces a magnetic field. For the third mark, say that this current is changing, which causes a changing magnetic field in the core. You need to say that the core strengthens the magnetic field. Then state that the field lines interact with the secondary coil and that this induces a voltage in the secondary coil. Um, if you think I said that quite fast, just rewind this video and listen again. But you do need to learn all the steps. It's a nightmare and I hate magnets too. You're not alone. But it is worth learning.